right. Well, uh, I also want to just uh, echo uh, Marcella's sentiments um, to thank you all for participating uh, in this program, joining us today. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, the Honorable Mike White join us as part of our series. Um, we've been uh, this is we've been waiting a year uh, <laughs> uh, for the, for this particular event. <clears throat> so the, what we're going to do, we, we want to we have a, a few questions that we want to we want. Uh, uh, Mayor Mike White to answer, but we also want to make this um, an interactive session. So there is going to be a, 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 an audience q and I'm going to be the moderator, so at the appropriate time when we call for audience questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand so that you can be recognized. You can uh, ask a question, and uh, as a moderator, I reserve all rights to do all that is necessary to make sure that um, we, that everyone has a fair shot at asking uh, questions uh, and also to make sure that we end on time. So I just want to uh, ask your indulgence and your forgiveness in advance in case uh, that becomes a, an issue. So at this point, um, you know, we're gonna, I want to jump right into the program, right into the questions, um, just because of, uh, in the interest of time. Um, I'm not going to read a bio about uh, the former mayor, Mike White. Uh, but that's information you can certainly find on, online, including on our, our website, bpacf.org. But suffice it to say that uh, Mayor Mike White is a recipient of our Black Professional of the Year Award. Um, he uh, is a former mayor of the city of Cleveland. Uh, he was a prolific leader uh, in the city of Cleveland, um, contributor to uh, a lot of the changes that you, positive changes that you've seen uh, around town. And so, we're very interested in his perspectives on leadership. And so I'm going to start with a question, which is this. <clears throat> so this event really is all about leadership. Um, and so can you just give us a quick overview of your career journey and highlighting along the way those key development stops of you know, where you develop your leadership style and your leadership ability? Well, uh, Ron, first of all, let me thank BPA for having me. Uh, I don't do a lot of this uh, anymore, but uh, when Marcella asked me, Marcella's here somewhere, uh, when she asked me, I said uh, I wanted to do it because, uh, frankly, I've always appreciated the award that BPA uh, gave me. I also have a tremendous appreciation for the work you do uh, to promote the lives and futures of young people. African Americans who are trying to find their way in this country. Mm -hmm. So I want to just thank you for having me, and I want to thank all of you for uh, coming. Um, I have a pretty generic, I think, uh, beginning. I was born and raised in Glenville. There are some of you here I know who either uh, were born in Glenville or live in Glenville today. My father worked in a factory. My mother was a part-time uh, secretary. I uh, grew up there, and uh, frankly, a major turning point in my life was when I turned 13. In fact, probably one of the major things that happened to me when I was 13 you know about, but the other one you don't, and I don't usually talk about it publicly. However, I'm going to tonight because for those of you who are still sitting in a chair saying he doesn't look like a farmer, uh, you'll understand <laughs> a little bit more about why uh, what happened when I was 13 was important. First of all, <clears throat> at 13, I met uh, Carl Burton Stokes. Didn't meet him personally, but I met him on a 19-inch black and white television. He was running for mayor, and I was just totally and unalterably absorbed by not only how he was doing what he was doing, but what he was doing, and most importantly, why he said he wanted to do it. So for me, at 13, uh, part of my professional life became fairly cemented. The other thing that happened to me is I went to work for Dr. Johnson. He was an African-American PhD in agriculture. Uh, he ran one of the Cleveland Public Schools uh, gardening programs, or about a half dozen of them. And uh, I worked for him for several years. And you might think that when you're working for a PhD in agriculture and a gardening program for young people, that all you learn about is agriculture. And that is partially true. Uh, but I learned so much more from him. I learned. Uh, uh, I learned more about uh, the work ethic, about character, about keeping your word. All the things that are important tools to have uh, in the world today, I learned from him. And so for me, uh, 
pursuing both of those ideas was pretty preset in my mind. Uh, I went off to college, first one in my family to go. Uh, ended up uh, running for student body president at Ohio State. And there I had a number of engagements, which I don't want to bore you about, within various political situations. Uh, frankly, most people don't realize it, but the first politician I ever worked for was a Republican uh, in Columbus. So uh, from that day until the day I left City Hall, uh, there's been a number of stops uh, along the way. Uh, I will tell you, though, that I have been very blessed uh, to be able to pursue the two uh, desires of my life. One was to serve my hometown, mm -hmm. uh, which I still consider to be my hometown, and the other was to, uh, for lack of a better term, to be a farmer, which is uh, <laughs> what I do for part of my life now, although I am also in the city of Cleveland as a consultant to the Mandel Foundation. So in a in about three minutes, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. We'll talk about more later. Outstanding. So <clears throat> we have finally reached the year 2018, when 60% of all jobs in the state of Ohio now require a degree beyond high school. For many students, just getting to the high school finish line is a challenge. I think you experienced that uh, in your political career here. Uh, in 2012, the Cleveland Metropolitan School District's graduation rate was 66%. In 2017, it was 71%. Tell us your view of the current state of the uh, school system. Well, uh, I think there should be no one in Cleveland who is happy with the state of uh, public education uh, in Cleveland for a number of reasons. But I, I would just try to lay out two of them to you, because I think I'm going to come back to it later. Uh, I don't think there has ever been a time uh, when education uh, was so important to our uh, survival as a people. Uh, we'll talk probably about some of the world affairs or national affairs that are going on, uh, but none of us should be happy with uh, a 71% graduation rate in a state where 60% of the people uh, have to have something beyond that. We have got to uh, step up our game in the area of public education. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there are probably two or three things that I think are critical. I think, first of all, uh, we are going to have to re-engage the system as stakeholders. They called them parents in my time. Uh, a lot of people make huge <laughs> demands of public school systems, whether they're in Baltimore, Miami, Cleveland, Dallas, it doesn't matter. And uh, I've said over and over again that if we are going to see a significant increase in the education of our children, yes, there's going to have to be reform on the educational side, but there's also going to have to be some reform on our side where we commit ourselves to being more engaged uh, with our children. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like an old-fashioned notion, uh, but in reality, you can have a PhD in every classroom, and if you don't have engaged parents, uh, you're not going to have a big change. Now, there are a lot of reasons why those parents are there, one me being a, a school system that historically has not been welcoming to working class people. I don't care whether they're black, brown, blue, or yellow. But I think, for me, one of the things that I think is critically important, and it seems like, a, it seems like an easy thing to do or something that shouldn't be that important in the 21st century, uh, but it is helping young people believe that they really can do anything they want to do mm -hmm. if they want to do it bad enough. You know, <clears throat> a number of my campaigns were breakout campaigns. They were not, it wasn't a position handed to me. I had to take on an incumbent and I had to beat that incumbent. And I was asked one time when I was running against a, an incumbent, uh, and after I won, uh, they said, did you ever think you would lose? And I said, no, I never thought I would lose. And I said, well, that's, that's, that's pretty cocky, pretty egotistical. I said, no, it's really not. I said, you have to understand that I went to the Cleveland Public Schools, and my entire time from Miles Standish to Glenville, I never met a teacher, a guidance counselor, a principal, assistant principal, or a custodian who told me I couldn't do what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. that I couldn't choose and, and prevail in my chosen field. So when everybody around you says you can fly, you believe can you fly. can fly. Yeah. And when everybody around you tells you you will never fly because, you know, your daddy has a high school education, your mama cleans rooms at the Wyndham, then by and large you're going to think you can't fly. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, give young people computers. Uh, yes, uh, do all the other whiz bang modern 21st century things they're doing in the area of education today. But we have got to ensure that our young people believe that they can fly, can believe in themselves. And I believe that's half the battle. Mm -hmm. And then I think the second part is to not accept 71% high school graduation. That the bar ought to be not just high school graduation, but how many of that 71 or 85, whatever the number is, how many of them are going to college? Because that's what they're going to need. Or how many are getting a skill? I'm not a, of the ilk that the world is going to be saved by every young person walking around with a degree. But you have to be able to do something that is economically desired by the population. Excellent. You know, um, there are people who begin to are professing that you don't need a college degree to be, uh, to be successful. And in fact, uh, I've heard commentary from some folks who, who suggest that you know, telling kids that they have to go to college is presumptuous. Um, what, what do you, how do you respond to, to how do you respond to that? Um, I personally, <laughs> I, I may as well tell you my own story. Uh, I have two children. One is twenty, going to be twenty-seven soon. The other is twenty-three. And uh, like the dutiful, educated African American male, they had their four ninety-ones or four whatever they're called all set up, they had all the college funds there, and commitment, the whole ball of wax. They had parents who, between them, had four degrees, the whole archetype educational portfolio, and neither one of them wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. In fact, they rejected it uh, out of hand. And so my oldest kind of floundered a little bit and finally decided she wanted to be a cosmetologist. And uh, she had wanted to be one while she was in high school, but mm -hmm. for a number of reasons, she was dissuaded from that. Uh, so once that became clear that that was what she wanted to do, that was her desire, that was her journey, I wanted two things for her. I wanted her first to be the best cosmetologist she can be. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I wanted her to be on the business side of cosmetology and just standing up for 14 hours a day, taking care of helping somebody else look good. So I've become involved in that. So um, I think part of it for me, and I don't want to make this focused on me, I had to not try to have my daughter live my life as I wanted it for her, mm -hmm. but I wanted her to live a life where she can contribute. So to answer your question, Ron, there are skills that the society wants. Mm -hmm. there is it, there's the educational component. There's the hard skills, construction, you have you. There's a, a mix of things that young people can do. But as Martin Luther King said, I don't care whether you empty garbage cans but just, or empty garbage trucks, just be the best mm -hmm. garbage mm -hmm. truck emptier that there is. So I think the question is not, I want you to go to college. I think the question is, what's your passion? Mm -hmm. What's going to get you up every morning? What's going to make you smile? What's going to make you run outside like you have never, ever um, run before? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, I can still remember uh, the first director I had who decided that they were going to hang it up. They weren't going to stay with the administration any longer. And I sat down with them. They were great. They were going to do good wherever they went. And I remember saying to myself when they left, I said, how could anybody not want this job? I mean, this, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 14 hours a day. It's six, sometimes seven days a week. It's 30 unions. It's the media, it's all of that, but it's just a great job serving the people of the city of Cleveland. My point was, either I was passionate or crazy, mm -hmm. but the people never found out I was crazy, so I call myself passionate. <laughs> so I think, I think if you're passionate about it, whether you're a bricklayer, whether you're a cosmetologist, whether you're mayor of the city of Cleveland, whether you're a brain surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic, we ought to not try to drive our young people into a, a, a lane, but to say, what gets you up every morning? Mm -hmm. What do you want to do, and do you want to do it the best? And then we need to help them do it the best. Thank you. All right. So because we're talking about leaders, um, it's probably appropriate to talk about leadership at the national level. So you know, everyone from the media to the barbershop has a lot to say about <clears throat> our, our current president. Uh, the focus lately has been on his lack of regard or respect for racial and ethnic diversity, 
Uh, what do you believe is the impact that the Trump administration has on race relations in America? I actually saw the question, so I, I was not unaware the question was coming. And one of the things that I thought about as I drove uh, from our farm today was that I wanted to try to respond in a way that is not uh, CNN or MSNBC. <laughs> uh, we all know what it is, mm -hmm. but what we think we know is only a part of it. It is only what is above the surface. Most people who watch what's going on become so absorbed on what's on the surface that they really don't understand the, the, the things that are going on under the surface that are much harder than you can ever imagine. Mm. For instance, uh, we don't see uh, ICE who's enforcing these horrible immigration uh, policies. We don't see the fact that they're getting ready to contract with a company for a nationwide license plate database, mm -hmm. uh, saying they're doing that for our safety, but they're going to be able to track any license plate in the entire United States of America. Mm -hmm. And they're saying they're doing that for our safety. We don't see the fact that there hasn't been one engagement by the Justice Department in a police shooting, whether it's police on African Americans, police on, on anybody, uh, since tr Trump took over. Mm -hmm. We don't see the rollbacks that are occurring, and the result of it is we are going to be sniffing dirtier air, we're going to be drinking dirtier water, and it's going to cause all kinds of secondary uh, issues. And I could go right down the, 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 the list. My point is that for all of the bad that we see, the real insidious nature of the Trump administration are the policy rollbacks that are taking place out of the glare of Congress, out of the glare of the media, and they're not going to tell you about it because they don't care because they're just trying to get through a 24-hour uh, music cycle. That's number one. Number two, anybody who believes that, that there isn't a 21st century kind of lynching going on, uh, they really need to go check themselves mm -hmm. pretty closely because that's what's going on. And this time, instead of just lynching black people, they're lynching uh, Hispanics, they're lynching Arabs, and they're lynching anybody that doesn't look like them. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what's going on, and we have to recognize it, and we have to be willing to fight it at all levels, whether that's political, whether that's uh, economic. Uh, no matter what it takes, we have to fight that every day, 24 hours a day. And I think the last point I would, would want to make is this. You know, <clears throat> um, Trump just didn't fly down from some planet and pop out of an egg. <laughs> the reality of it is, even though he didn't win the popular vote, he was enabled by millions and millions of people mm -hmm. who think just like him. Mm -hmm. Who think just like him, and a lot of them think even worse. Uh, and so you have, to, you have to ask yourself that if you're not Caucasian living in America, and if you're not rich living in America, what does it mean to you? I think it means, at least to me, that there is a clarion call to all of us who are able to redouble, rekindle, retriple, requadruple uh, our efforts at making this a sane, fair society to everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, or um, national origin. And f I also think it's incumbent upon us to recognize uh, that and I didn't bring it, but some of you know the poem or the saying by, I think it's Eichel, Eichel Miller, I could be wrong. And he talks about how uh, the Nazis came for certain people and I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when they came for me, there wasn't anybody hanging around. Right, right. Um, if, if you see what's going on with uh, uh, the dreamers and you are not as repulsed as an American, uh, by what they are doing. And if you see what's going on in terms of these ice roundups and you're not repulsed, mm -hmm. uh, then something's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I want to make this very short, but uh, I, in uh, 1985, became a state senator. And it was the first time I ever represented Jews in my life. I actually, for the first time, was representing Jews and I was representing Hispanics on the west side. But I want to stick with the Jews for a moment. 
So there was a Jewish uh, community center in Cleveland Heights. Mm -hmm. And this was, you know, there's a lot of Baki talk going on in those days. And so I went to uh, a community meeting, and uh, the room was probably about this size. And there had to be 100 Jews there. Probably the average age was 75, <laughs> and I was 35. And uh, I got up. I gave my speech. It was sincere. I was their state senator. I was the only state senator they're going to get for four years. And I came to tell them I was going to do the best I could, and I wanted to work with them and learn what their concerns were. And uh, I will never forget it. There was a woman, ma'am, sitting right where you are. And she just sat there. And when I was done, she stood up. And she must have had a back problem because she was leaning. And she says, why do you come here and tell us this? I said, you, she says, you don't believe this. Hmm. She says, we, we are for Baki. And she talked about a couple other things where blacks and Jews have disagreements. I listened to her. And I said, ma'am, let me tell you something. I can say this and believe it, and I'm going to do it whether you believe it or not, because the people who call me a dirty nigger are calling you dirty Jews. So we have a common enemy, not just physical, but a way of thought. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can overcome those kinds of enemies is to work together. Well, I believe that that's true of us as a people, mm -hmm. that we can't be so holed up in our journey, our life, our uh, epitaph, if you will, that we can't understand the horrible dynamics of what's going on and what's being done to other uh, individuals in this country. Because when we lose that passion and that understanding, and I think we lose part of our own soul. And then when, after you do that, you get as easy to say, well, you know, hey, I'm out here in Solon. <laughs> Why do I have to worry about uh, Tracy? She's, she's living on, on Huff. <laughs> This sister better get, a, get her own thing. <laughs> I'm out here in Seoul and doing my thing. It's very easy to do that. So I think the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we are all dreamers. Mm. We're all dreamers. Mm. The, one of the reasons I hope that 99% of you are part of BPA and that you might have come here tonight, because you are a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. I dream every day. But in order to actualize those dreams, we are going to have to double down mm -hmm. and do more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just kind of bringing it things a little bit back home here. So tell us what it's like to be from Cleveland and growing and becoming a leader in Cleveland. It I mean, was real hard. Yeah, I mean, t t talk about that. I mean, Cleveland's a pretty, can be pretty rough, you know, uh, on, on its native sons and it's certainly rough on outsiders. So. You know, you, you grew up in Glenville and, you know, you aspire to, to serve uh, the community, which you've done, I and mean, you've done admirably. But talk about how do, you, how do you do that? How do you navigate that? Well, I didn't really know that I had any leadership qualities until October of 1969. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't go into it now because you all don't have the time. And uh, I'm trying to really respect what Ron has said, but let's, you just have to trust me uh, about that. Uh, most people don't realize I'm really an introvert. I don't like crowds. Uh, never joined an organization when I was in high school. I worked from start of 13 on. Uh, the only reason I joined the graduation club uh, uh, called the Psychedelics, 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 because they had these great purple jackets, and I wanted one. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't because I wanted to be a part of this great, uh, great uh, group. But once uh, I, for lack of a better term, got turned out in the area of leadership, because it was something that was foisted, uh, I volunteered, but it was also foisted on me at the same time, I began to look around at other leaders. Mm -hmm. And I did it subconsciously. Uh, I looked at leaders that I admired, and I looked at leaders I didn't want to be like. I looked at leaders that had certain characteristics. And I try to learn those characteristics uh, um, as much as I could. Uh, hard work, dedication, integrity, vision, honesty. Um, people believe today that you cannot practice that in the political field. You can. Mm -hmm. You just have to want to practice those things in the political field. And so for me, I return home. Uh, I end up working 
for the president of the Cleveland City Council. And I'm now 25. I'm in meetings with W.O. Walker. I'm in meetings with George Forbes, Arnold Pinckney, Lou Stokes, and then later on Carl Stokes, all my elders. And the first thing I did in all those meetings was keep my damn mouth shut <laughs> and keep my eyes open and learn what was being said and what was being done and to be able to do what I was being asked to do to the best of my ability. Mm -hmm. So I not only was able to be in those rooms, uh, I was given more and more tangible opportunities to do things which, frankly, my elders either did not want to or did not think they could. It was a kind of a generational thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I absorbed all of this. And then you fast forward to 1989. Um, I, you know, I, I told people when I uh, uh, ran, I think only Donna Nelson believed that Donna uh, worked, she and I worked together when I was a state senator and I told her I was going to be mayor and that's all I wanted to be. She might have been the only human being in Cleveland that believed it when I, when I won finally. So it's 1989, I'm running for mayor, I got my team, uh, I'm going around seeing all my elders, all my elders. I don't talk about this very often. I'm not angry about it, but it's just true because it goes to your question. All my elders said yes. Every elder you can think about in the political process in our community said, oh, yes, Michael, you're the one. You've been here. You've learned. You're smart. You're ready. And then uh, in August of uh, 1989, now, remember, I started running in January, January 25th of 1989. On, in August, I think it was around the 19th of 1989, the president of the city council decides he wants to be mayor. <laughs> and uh, every single one of my elders That's dropped out of my race. Yeah. I didn't get one. It was so bad they wouldn't even meet with me in a telephone booth. <laughs> now, it wasn't that they disliked me. It wasn't necessarily, I think, that they thought that uh, my opponent would do a better job. Uh, it was generational, mm -hmm. that they could not bring themselves to support a person running against someone of their ilk of their generation. Mm. And um, after the race was over, I told somebody on a stage once, I said, I don't ever want there to be another Mike White. I said, we have got to learn our business, do our business, but when it comes time, we, we've got to find people and we've got to turn it over and step back. You know, we, we, we have to do that. Other, other ethnic groups do that. Uh, and we don't do enough of it. Now, we've got some problems with, uh, in my opinion, with how the maturation process takes place, but we've got, we cannot be afraid of young people. We cannot say, Marcella, go to college, get good grades, come back, sit down, shut up, and when I die, you stand up and do your thing, girl. <laughs> that's not, that's, we can't do that. We have got to nurture, we have got to educate in the, in the universities, educate on the street, and provide opportunities for our young people to grow. And when it comes time, we have to stand aside, hopefully to provide advice and let them go do it, and recognize they're going to make mistakes. Yeah. So I would say only to your question is this, that every single one of you can be a mentor, one young person on a personal level in some area of expertise. And there's probably never been an area more important than in the political arena. Very quickly, I think there's three, I think there's a stool of survival for us. And that stool has three legs. It's economics, it's education, and it's politics. We have to pursue those three stool legs with all the gusto we have. And we have to be good at it. And it has to be a business and not personal. So I'll shut up there. All right, well, just um, before we move on to the audience questions, I just want to kind of piggyback uh, on, on this last question here. So you talked about this maturation process, and you know, I've, I've heard from a, a number of young uh, aspiring leaders who lament the fact that they feel that there really isn't an opportunity for transfer of power. And, and so you know, they, they, they feel, just like, just like your story, you've got the elders who sort of want to hold on to, to power and influence, and they don't necessarily want to pass it down. But I've also heard from others, from some of the, the elders who say, well, they ain't ready, they ain't ready. So how do you, what, what's the maturation process you gotta take look it. like? You got to take it. 
Go ahead. Talk, talk about well, that. Well, I mean, I took it, and okay. I think others could. I, okay. Let me say two very quick things. Yeah. First of all, I think there are too many young people who feel Kent State's preparing them to be a city councilman. Mm -hmm. Kent State doesn't prepare, or Ohio State, or Case Western doesn't prepare you to be a councilman. What prepares you to be a councilman is going to ward clubs, being a precinct committeeman, working with the councilman, getting out and walking in the rain. My first campaign for council, I lost 21 pounds. I hit every single door three times. And believe me, it looks like I can lose a little weight now. In those days, I didn't, couldn't lose any weight. It's, it's the art of the business, and mm -hmm. you don't learn that by going to college. Mm -hmm. Now, should you go to college if you want to be? I'm just talking now about political. Absolutely, political absolutely. You should absolutely go. Mm -hmm. But that's a part of it. Okay. My other part was sitting at the calling post with W.O. Walk and the other people that I mentioned. It was representing the city council when we were in default, when the city was in default. It was going out and working in some of the intra little fights that occurred politically from time to time and making sure that we were on the winning side. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that prepared me to be able to be ready. And then once I was ready and I presented myself and there was an agreement that I was ready and it was still a no, then I had to go take it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, this is not a brag, that's just a reality. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Malcolm X said, power never concedes without a demand. Mm -hmm. Now, would I like to see it concede? Yes. Do I think it's going to change anytime soon? No. And so you have to go out and do the hard work. And it's hard work. My first uh, uh, campaign for, that I ran here was for Lou Stokes. I ran his campaign. I've run about six or seven campaigns. I've run the Jesse Jackson County presidential campaigns. I ran the statewide once. Anyway, I had worked 16 hours one time. I was driving home on King Boulevard, fell asleep, and hit a tree. I mean, I wasn't delegating to somebody else. I was out there doing that work with a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. It is really, really hard work. You're going to sweat. You're going to toil. People are not going to completely understand. But you've got to put that in in order to get what you want. And if you don't put it in, you won't get it. Because I want to be your councilman or I want to be your mayor because I went to Kent State. That doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. There's more to life than just that. It helps prepare you. I went to college, one of the reasons I went to college was I didn't think people would elect a high school graduate as their mayor. And also the Vietnam War was going on at the same time. So I think you've got to prepare yourself. You've got to be able to do all of the dirty grunt work that prepares you to understand it's a business and what you do. And then if you think you're ready and you're told no, you've got to go do it anyway, even if you lose. Because even in losing, you win, you win because something. you've learned. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so now, now we're going to open up the, uh, uh, for audience questions. Uh, we have a question over here, uh, and there's a microphone. So Marcel is going to walk over uh, and use the microphone because we are recording this. If you can just stand up and state your name. So I'm Ron Woodford. Uh, as, as leadership trends go, right, uh, traditionally there's been transactional leadership you know, historically, right, then in the 90s and 2000s we kind of got into serving leadership, and now we're moving into transformational leadership. So I'd like to get your view on uh, what this transition is and, um, you know, how you view transformational versus transactional leadership. Well, first of all, sir, I don't agree with your analysis. Uh, because I think that if you are a true servant leader, then you can be all those other things, other, all, all those other things even sometimes a transformational leader, excuse me, a, a um, transactional leader. I think if you're a servant leader, you have to, first of all, be completely uh, uh, accepting in your own skin of what that means. Being a servant leader, you've got to make a lot of sacrifice. That's a very hard thing to do on a consistent basis. People don't all the time understand. People don't all the time care. But you've got to do it anyway because it's a higher calling. And then there are going to be times when you have to be a transformational leader, but in the framework of being a servant leader. And then there are times when you've got to put on a different face. Clarissa will talk about this in session 16. 
Uh, <laughs> you've got to put on a different face and go be a transactional leader. Um, when Jay Westbrook lost city council president and I had to deal with Mike Polinsic, frankly, I wouldn't go across the street and spit on Mike Polinsic if he was on fire. But the people of the city of Cleveland paid me to get along with city council the best I could, so I invited him to lunch. I invited him to dinner. And I wanted a transaction for the good of the people of the city of Cleveland. Let's set our 25-year personal relationship aside. Let's do what's best for the city of Cleveland. So my belief is if you're a servant leader that, and you have a kind of a awareness about yourself, you can draw on those other aspects in order to achieve your needs. But at the base, at the core of it, always has to be the servant leader especially when you're doing a transaction, because you have to remember why you're in the room so you can get out of the room and not be that transactional person. All right. Another question in the back? Really? OK. Hi, Mr. White, Robin Williams. Uh, you yourself, as well as the elders that you had mentioned, many black professionals of the year were trailblazers and one of the first of many. Can you speak to 25 years out, many of the generations that's here today, do you think the doors, uh, as far as being open to African Americans in the city of Cleveland, uh, is better, uh, greater? Uh, can you speak a little to that? Thank you. You know, uh, my mother died when I was 33. It was a very bad time for me. And I can still remember that pain. And uh, my father died when I was 59. And that was painful. But probably one of the top three most painful things in my life was when it dawned on me that my children were going to have to fight the same battles I fought. Mm -hmm. Same battles that W.O. Walker fought. Same battles that... Medgar ever fought, same battles that Dr. King fought, only it's going to be a lot more high tech. It's going to be a lot more uh, special forces, elusive, not seen directly. People aren't in your face. Um, I returned home in 1973, I think it was, and there, none of you all existed. I don't mean physically, but the kinds of people you are, you didn't exist. I mean, there's, you could probably put the number of people like the things you all are doing, you know, in a, in a phone booth. So on that level, there's been a tremendous amount of progress. But clearly, we have to do more. We have to do better. We are penetrating a lot of institutions in this community, but we're still far behind on the economic side. The people who are penetrating those institutions are doing very well financially, and they should because they're contributing. But at the same time, we cannot lose focus of the necessity to have our own piece of the pie. You know, I'm always reminded about the story of uh, these five Jewish people. They showed up at a hotel, and they wouldn't, nobody would serve them. Uh, and they came back the next day, and they owned the hotel. Uh, and uh, being, owning your own business and providing a service is not for everyone. But I think if there's ever an area that we need to continue pushing, it is uh, evolving and developing our own economic foothold uh, in a country where that kind of power means a great deal. So yes, keep penetrating the institutions. It's very important, all the, you know, the banks and insurance companies and so forth. But at the same time, uh, and I can speak with some uh, knowledge, you know, owning a small business is tough work. But at the end of the day, to not only develop that business and be able to pass it down generationally, I think, is something that we have to really, really focus on. Good evening, Mayor White. Good evening. George Williams. Could you um, go back in time a little bit and talk about the day the Browns <laughs> decided to move and all of a sudden you're ahead of a football team? Can you provide I'll do it some briefly. <laughs> <laughs> and from a leadership standpoint, how you had to take the ball and uh, get us over the goal line. OK. Um, I want to go, is it Mr. Wood, Wood? Woodford? Woodford. I want to go back to you. I, I haven't forgot the Browns. I want to go back to you for a minute, Mr. Woodford. I want to make sure that I was being clear. I think the servant leader is at the core, but I also do agree with you about the need for transformational leaders. However, I think it's 
I think the transformational leader has to have a transformational message that everyone can pick up and run with when the transformational leader goes down or runs out of years in the White House. We are a people who, by and large, gravitate around a personality. Uh, we, the personality is transformative. We follow that personality. And we get so caught up in that personality that we aren't caught up in the vision. So when that personality leaves, goes down, resigns, or what have you, we feel that whatever that vision was has gone away. The, the vision has to always remain intact, no matter who the vision carrier is. And that's one area that I think is so critically important. And I think, going back to your point, servant leaders and transformational leaders have to say that over and over and over again. And I mean, I could go right to Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, it's when you look at what happened when he was assassinated, uh, when you look at the, uh, the, the problems that the, an organization like the NAACP has had in terms of their leadership, um, we've gotten so caught up in the personality, we haven't thought about the vision. The vision is always more important than the individual. You know, I remember, uh, uh, you know, I'm a big, big uh, Western kind of person, and how the, the, the settlers were fighting the Native Americans, and the chief would get killed, and his number two would quickly take up his main and his staff, and they would keep right on going. I always saw that. There is no leader who is more important than the vision. The leaders come and go. The vision has to remain uh, intact and undefiled. And I think that is something that we sometimes don't uh, recognize as being essential to our, um, to our survival. And I didn't want to go too far on this, but I, in my days, I felt that I was trying to carry, notwithstanding my little experience when I ran for mayor, I wanted to carry the vision of the men. At that time, there were, weren't a lot of women, hardly any in, at that level. I wanted to carry the vision uh, of the men that were in that room as it pertains to a better Cleveland and a better us. Notwithstanding what happened, they couldn't help that. The day after I won, the first person I called was Arnold Pinckney. I said, okay, Arnold, we can be friends again. And Arnold became one of the closest people to me uh, that I, there ever was in terms of my uh, election as mayor. So I don't want to belabor this. I think you're right, the servant leader is critically important, but the vision and where we're going and what we need to do is the key thing. And when a leader goes down, we need to pick it up. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Got it. But what I'm getting at is, is I'm not from New York. I'm from New York and New Jersey. So I come out of a transitional political environment with Mayor Gibson. And then I see you as transformation. You know, him obviously was from white to black. With you, it was from the young to old, right? Yes. Yeah. You said, if you would have been transactional, you would not have run. The elders would have said to you, you can't run. You would have said, oh, the, transactionally, the structure, the box that I have to stay in says I don't run until they give me permission. You right. said, no, I'm going to transform this thing and go ahead outside of the box, right, in one. And that's why I was asking you. Yes. No, I, I, was, I, was, I really in, enjoyed the question. That's why I wanted to come back to it. OK, the Browns. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it's an integral part of where we're going to be. What kind of leaders are we going to have? The Browns. Uh, I'm not sure what I could tell you. Uh, it is, uh, very simply put, Art Modell told us he wanted a renovated stadium. He didn't want a new stadium. He woke up one day and said to himself, Art, you're just about out of money, so where can I get some more money? And the mirror said, Art, there's a guy in, uh, in, in Maryland who will pay you $323 million, and all you have to do is pick up your football team and move there. And he said, Eureka, I'm going to be rich again. Now, that is really the subtotal uh, of it all. However, what Mr. Modell didn't see coming and what the NFL didn't see coming was a, an attack based on the principles of Dr. King. Believe it or not, the whole core strategy of the Save Our Browns campaign came straight out of the Civil Rights Manual. That's the only manual I had, so I had to use what I had. So what are they? Well, first of all, 
you determine whether or not you have legal standing, which is something we've done. We clearly had legal standing, but legal standings take a long time to win. So you get that ball rolling. Second of all, you appeal on a broader level. You don't talk to the people who have screwed you. <clears throat> you talk to the broader audience. And you try to find people in a broader audience who are believers. When Dr. King was giving all those speeches, he wasn't just talking to people in the church. He was talking to America. And the more he did that, the more he talked to America, the more America began to look at themselves. Thirdly, and I will be honest with you and tell you this did not come out of the manual, third of all, that it was just about Cleveland we were going to lose. But once we began disrupting all the other teams, not all of them, about half of them, disrupting their business, then the other owners were dragged into the fight. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> it means getting two, three hundred faxes a day. It means people in a room calling every five minutes to the Philadelphia Eagles. It means a bus traveling around to a number of stadiums, even some of the owners letting you on the field, which makes all the other owners look bad. And so it was attacking them in places where they were really soft. If we had just waited on the legal side, we would have lost. And that's, I think, a major reason why we were able to succeed, because they basically paid us, I think, $70 million to go away, plus a new stadium and a team to go away. You know, the, I, this is not a brag, but the night of um, the, big, the big peace treaty, there was food and all the stuff you do at a peace treaty, and Tagliabue came up to my wife and said, you know, your husband's really something, but we hope we never see him again. <laughs> <laughs> and so that told me that we had disrupted their economic model to the point where it was easier to pay us off and get a team than to keep fighting. Hi, I'm Karen Marshall. Hello, Ms. Marshall. And I recently relocated back um, to Cleveland from Columbus, Ohio. I um, was residing there for the past 20 years, in which I witnessed a huge transformation with housing development, um, businesses, uh, corporate headquarters relocating there, shopping. Um, and coming back to Cleveland, one of the key things that stands out in my mind as a legacy from your, um, your tenure as mayor is the housing, you know, and how you, I think you had a goal of you wanted to have so many, I don't know if it was over 200 or 400 new homes in, on the east side of Cleveland, which makes a huge difference for the east side, focusing on the east side of Cleveland. Um, taking a look at Cleveland now or either northeast Ohio, what do you think are our greatest opportunities and the greatest threats? Hmm. Wow, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, Ms. Marshall? Yes. Did I say that right? Um, this will not be an inclusive, this will not be an inclusive list, so I'll be, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I think first of all, uh, I think the neighborhoods of Cleveland are moving in the right direction. It is slow, it's slower on the east side than on the west side, but it, they are still moving in the right direction. Uh, there is, um, anecdotal, and some not anecdotal information, that young African-American millennials are starting to move back into some of these neighborhoods, especially along Huff and Glenville, and some in Collinwood, but not a, a lot yet. So that's number one. They're, the needle is moving in the right direction, I think, in these neighborhoods, and the more we can uh, get uh, investment, whether that's a physical investment, bringing your family, or whether that's a financial investment with a small business, the more we can get that, the better. I think second of all, uh, uh, there's got to be a renewed uh, acceptance or renewed commitment to educational achievement. And we, I think, have to do more to raise that bar. 71% uh, in 2017 or 2018 is completely unacceptable. And I think thirdly, it is going to be extremely important if we are going to, to, I think, see some of the things that we need to see there is for us to be more engaged in business development, mm -hmm. you know, in, in some of these neighborhoods and not only developing the business but hiring our own training and so forth. So I think you're talking about physical development, human development, and economic development as being, I think, three of the keys to, to uh, what's going on. And I also think, just very quickly, piggybacking on what's going on. I mean, the, the 105 Ashbury Superior, mm -hmm. uh, Ashbury Superior Churchill corridor is the next hot corridor uh, in an east side neighborhood because of what's happening in University Circle. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the Euclid corridor heading out in East Cleveland is also another one. Taking an existing major development, like a rock on a pond, and using it as a ripple to develop off of. So it's, uh, we're, we're just about out of time. Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Mr. White to uh, just talk a little bit about the Neighborhood Leadership Development Program. Um, because this gets to the human development aspect and leadership development. So can you just give a, a brief overview of what is the, uh, that program? Uh, who, who is that program targeting and, and what do program participants, what should they expect to get out of that program? Um, well, first of all, one of our cohort participants, Clarissa, is here tonight. She is a participant in cohort 12. Mm -hmm. um, The Mandel Foundation for the last, uh, going on 12 years, has sponsored the Neighborhood Leadership Development Program. We identify engaged community leaders who are already making a difference. They're already making some progress. And they look around and they say to themselves, hmm, God, I'd like to make more, but I think I'm at the end of my knowledge base to be a better leader. And we identify these individuals by and large through an application and an interview process and we take 20 to 24 per year. We put them through an 11 month 16 session program designed to what we call put more leadership tools in their leadership toolkit. Uh, those those uh, sessions deal with everything from um, uh, program planning, program fundraising, uh, deals with, I'm, look, I'm looking for one in particular that I want to uh, deal with, uh, uh, it's not anger resolution, but it deals with resolution and uh, program facilitation. What are we trying to achieve? Well, what we want is when Clarissa leaves, she's going to be the same Clarissa, but she's going to have a bigger toolbox. Mm -hmm. She's going to be able to do more. It is the classic capacity building project at the human level. Mm -hmm. Who, what kind of people are we getting? We're basically, we're basically fishing for zealots. <laughs> Anybody know a zealot? A zealot is a person that doesn't need us in the first place. See, Clarissa's a zealot. The reason Clarissa is a zealot is because she's doing a lot of great things, and this is not a brag. She's going to be doing bigger, greater things when she leaves us, but she would have been doing bigger, greater things when she left us anyway. She's just going to do it faster, and she's going to do it bigger, mm -hmm. and she's going to have the network from NLDP there. So a zealot is a person who has a passion, who has a vision. You can shoot them, they're going to get up and they're going to keep coming. You can shoot them again, they're going to get up and they can keep coming. They will not respect or honor failure on anybody's terms. And those are the people we are trying to get. Our first six years, we took nothing but Cleveland residents. Today, we're taking individuals out of the inner ring suburbs. Mm -hmm. What do we want out of it? We want Clarissa to leave us in June and go out there and be bigger and better and do more for the young people that she's doing so much for. And if she continues to do that, our job then is to support her even if she's graduated. I tell some of our graduates, we're kind of like the mafia. Once you're with us, we never let you go. <laughs> it's called the Neighborhood Leadership Development Program. It, is, it has a website. Please take a look at it. And if you have any interest at all, uh, you know someone, uh, please don't hesitate to um, apply or to, to let somebody know about it. I will just tell you very quickly, we look at where a person is on the leadership spectrum and not how many pieces of paper they're hanging on their wall. Mm -hmm. We've had drug dealers, we've had ministers, we've had former prostitutes that have been in, in jail, we have PhDs in math. We have everybody on that spectrum, but where they all come together is their indefatigable commitment to a better Cleveland, mm -hmm. to better neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you like the wine. That was a, that was a shameful, shameless <laughs> plug. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. White. We thank really you. appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, audience, for your participation and for your, your wonderful questions. Are you going to be around for yes, a few minutes? Yes, I am. So feel free to, to engage uh, for a few minutes. Um, as Mr. White said, there is wine out there from his vineyard. So uh, please uh, sample and enjoy. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you for having me.